Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Okay. I'm, I'm good. It's the last forum of the semester. I think we've had an amazing semester. And uh, I'm so grateful to everyone who has spoken in the past weeks. So it is my delight to introduce our final speaker of the year, Josefina Borgos, who recently received her PhD from PCC. She wrote it on Whitehead and narrative. And uh, before I turn it over to her, let me just tell you a little bit about her. She uh, was born in Santiago, Chile, moved to the US in 1976, where she worked for 16 years as an architect in Washington, DC, uh, with the American Institute of Architects. She uh, then moved out to San Francisco and she got her master's in PCC. In 2003, one of her short stories, Thoughts on a Theme by a Seagull, was published and later that year her short story Adelaide was accepted for publication as well. I started reading Adelaide this morning and was completely delighted by it and I can't wait to go home and finish it. Um, I just had to put it off to come here to introduce you. Um, so I recommend all of you go check out Adelaide. Uh, in 2006, Josefina was asked to present uh, at the 10th annual Exploring the Boundaries of Experience and Self Conference at St. Anne's College in Oxford. Uh, the title of her presentation was Meaning in a Postmodern Universe. And then uh, she is also the author of Imagination and the Epic of Evolution, which was published in the Evolutionary Epic, Science's Story and Humanity's Response, which came out in 2009. And in 2010, her piece, The, Necess the Necessary Flow of Wisdom, was published in Science, Wisdom, and the Future, Humanity's Quest for a Flourishing Earth, which came out two years ago. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Josefina. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I know you guys are all writing papers, so I appreciate the effort very much. Thank you, Matt and Becca, for uh, inviting me to participate in this forum series. I see some familiar faces. It's nice to see you all again, and I hope that we can um, create some good discussion tonight, because that's one of the reasons I'm here, okay? Um, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you tonight, because I'm not going to present a, a work that is, you know, finished and completed with hypotheses and conclusions. I'm, what I'm going to present, in fact, is the outline for a new project, you can call it kind of a proposal, for a new project that I'm involved in, which uh, has been, the idea of this project uh, comes from uh, a publishing, com uh, the, the, the publishing uh, company that sponsored some of the conferences for, that I've uh, presented in. So uh, I'm going to throw out some ideas, I'm going to present an outline, and I hope I get some suggestions from you all being, all being as bright as you are after the presentation is done. So um, the project that I'm involved in is uh, intended to continue the work that I started with my dissertation. And uh, it's the, you know, my intention is to make available to the general public the possibility of getting acquainted with uh, new ways of uh, envisioning reality that are different from the prevailing uh, me mechanistic paradigm. Now for this work in general, I have set myself a principle, and that principle is that any metaphysical speculation or philosophical speculation today that is, you know, it's um, uh, put out to the general public on, or, or is even uh, considered, uh, cannot ignore the scientific achievements and insights of the 20th century and what's going on of the 20s, on the 21st century. Uh, I would like to emphasize uh, here that apart from the revolutionary scientific um, developments that we are all already familiar with, and uh, relativity and quantum theory and whatever that I'm going to mention later on, there, there are things going on every day. 
there are uh, scientific achievements, uh, not only scientific achievements, but achievements in other fields, and that we as um, philosophers should keep an eye we, we should keep pace with them because they, all these things have to be incorporated in, into our philosophical thinking. And I brought, in, in, you know, I brought a couple of examples that caught my attention uh, from uh, the San Francisco Chronicle that were published about a month ago. One of them is uh, related to children's psychology and it's related to studies that are being done at the U University of California in Berkeley. And it got my attention because it contradicts Jean Piaget's theory about uh, uh, children between the ages of two and seven. Jean Piaget thought that these children could not, at this age, children couldn't uh, uh, think logically or rationally. And after 10 years of observation, the psychologists at Berkeley have come up with the contrary conclusions. They say that toddlers are capable of thinking, toddlers and infants are capable of thinking logically and abstractly. And I'm going to read you a little paragraph here to tell you what exactly is what we're talking about. It says, the main thing is that they are drawing conclusions from data and evidence and experiences the same way scientists are by making hypotheses, testing them, analyzing statistics, and even doing experiments, even though when they do experiments, it's called getting into everything. Mm -hmm. So the point is basically is that these kids are getting, going through the process of the, of the same process scientists go through, but they're doing it unconsciously. So, wow, there's a lot of food for thought there for us who are interested in consciousness and the structure of consciousness and the evolution of consciousness in, uh, hu in the human being. So, that's one example. And the other example, briefly, is um, a study that's going on now in, at Stanford University that it's uh, being done by some scientists that devised a, uh, an algorithm for that, uh, that allows monkeys to move a cursor on the screen without, I mean, without touching the screen, only by thought. Now, this had been done before in humans, but never had been done in animals. And of course, the, the scientists are very excited because they think that they're going to be able to help a lot of people with disabilities or people that have been paralyzed. Uh, but also they're very excited because these things are going to have a lot of practical ap applications. But the thing is, you know, nobody is projecting this into how or why or how do we connect it with our interest, with our, with our thinking. How can we connect this, for example, with transpersonal psychology? Can we connect this with... Uh, the action at the distance that quantum mechanics, quantum physics talks about? I don't know, but I just, and I know I'm getting out of the subject a little bit here, but I want to emphasize always that we must keep an eye on the disciplines around us that, um, you know, that we have to keep inputting into our, our frame of thinking, our frame of thought. So that's why I always like to quote um, a philosopher, uh, philosopher Robert Neville, <coughs> who wrote a, an article in the Process Studies Journal uh, in 1987 called Contributions and Limitations of Process Philosophy. And he, his, he stated then that contemporary metaphysical thought must be envisioned and be informed by the disciplines which have produced the most significant intellectual developments during the last 100 years. And so in, in, in trying to figure out, in trying to find a portal through which to um, explain in an accessible way postmodern philosophy and metaphysical thought, I, f I focused on a, on a concept that I think uh, 
complies with uh, Neville's requirements. And I think also that it is a concept that lies at the core of the difference between the static mechanistic conception of, of uh, reality and the uh, new cosmological and metaphysical outlook. And that also is implicitly present at the core of the scientific enterprise today, not only in physics, but in evolutionary biology, in semiotics, in biosemiotics, in complexity theory, and in the area of uh, the, um, the uh, humanities transpersonal psychology. Now, this is the concept of becoming that I would like then to develop in this project to bring over. So, I believe that becoming as opposed to being is the core of the new cosmological and metaphysical outlook. And here I'm talking of the becoming that's implied in Teilhard's uh, uh, postulate of the cosmogenesis of matter, the becoming that is latent in Henry Bergson's duration, the um, becoming conceived as Whitehead's concrescence, the becoming that implies a timeless dimension, a timeless time, if, even if that is a contradiction, that lies between the before and the now, and between the now and the after, between the possible and the actual. And I, 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 I'm pleased to add, is the becoming that is described by physicist Werner Heisenberg in his book Physics and Philosophy, which he published in 1958, where he wrote, and I quote, the probability wave introduces something standing in the middle between the idea of an event and the actual event. A strange kind of physical reality just in the middle between possibility and reality. So I believe that in all its wonder, if this dimension of reality which is currently underappreciated within uh, our culture's implicit understanding, if this idea can be made accessible to the general public, it will open doors for a more solidarious and participatory state of consciousness, a state of consciousness which, in which we will find itself, ourselves in love, uh, not only with the Earth community, but with the com universe community as well. So the big question is, how can the concept of becoming as I've described it here, be explained in an accessible manner. Uh, I was thinking in my own journey toward an understanding of the full implications of this concept. And I believe that the first step would be to take the reader's imagination to an understanding of the idea of, of the universality of experience or pan-experientialism. Uh, I believe that the reader should be ushered, ushered, ushered? Mm -hmm. ushered. ushered into questioning the modern premise that experience has to be conscious and that it only pertains to the sphere of the living. I find that that is the hardest barrier that comes up when this issue is discussed. People, it's very difficult for people to accept the fact that non-sentient living uh, beings uh, experience. So I think that in order is to start getting into this idea of, of, of a new postmodern uh, metaphysics, this idea of the uh, universality of experience is kind of fundamental. Um, now to do that, I think it would be necessary to go to the very bottom of complexity as science describes it now, where entities, still at an unconscious level, exchange signals of all kinds which communicate meaning. I, I think that I probably would base my research here on the work of biologist Brian Goodwin, who used to teach at uh, Schumacher, uh, theoretical biologist and complexity researcher Stuart Kaufman, and biosemiotician Jesper Hofmeier. Why? Because their work tells us that plants and animals, all organisms, live first and foremost in a world 
of signs and signification. That's their terms. That semiosis is not necessarily limited to the biosphere. And that signs of some kind, electromagnetic, chemical, uh, uh, aromas, noise, uh, um, um, are also underlie the non-living world. And so we see a world you know, that's full of sign producers and sign receivers. Now, these insights of biosemiotics and complexity theory make the pan-experientialist model much more viable. And following that, we, we can then, it could, it could then be explained that the exchange of meaning gives origin to cause and effect. There's a stimulus, there's a response. And cause and effect are what make are what make the universe roll. In fact, uh, you know, what I discussed in my dissertation is, uh, that is that meaning is what lies in the interstice between cause and effect, but that's another subject and, and I'm not going to touch it tonight. Now, as a second path, as a second step towards the path of understanding uh, the concept of becoming, uh, the fact that the experience of meaning and its interrelationship with cause and effect are universal, needs to crystallize into the notion that the human, in body and in mind, and as a constituent of the universe, is built on meaning and on meaning's relationship with cause and effect. So throughout its history and prehistory, humanity has evolved in the world through its dealing with these two terms. In order to survive and to prevail, uh, humanity has struggled to comprehend the cause behind every effect in every behind uh, the effect in every phenomenon uh, it encounters in daily life. However, there has always been a dimension of this phenomena where the causes have remained unknown, mysterious. There has always been a real world, an understandable world, and the world of the unknown causes. So since the very beginning, humanity has been faced with this duality, the comprehensible and the incomprehensible, the known and the mystery. So, uh, in the early attempts at metaphysics, and I, I'm thinking metaphysics, metaphysics uh, as Lakoff and Johnson define it, and I love this definition, they say metaphysics is nothing but a fancy name for our concern for what is real. Since the beginning of metaphysics, in humanity imagined these unknown causes as gods, as the god of fertility, the god of war, the god of the underworld, the god of love, etc. And explained the world of the unknown causes through mythology and or religion or both. They even located the gods in a physical place within the physical world. Later on, with the advent of monotheism, the unknown causes became one final cause and God was placed in heaven, which is probably a remnant from a, a past paradigm. Uh, and during and after the Renaissance, even this one final cause was deemed unnecessary. And without a cause, without an explanation for the effect of the world and humanity, the world and life became meaningless. And that is what reached, that has reached us as our crisis of meaning in our current culture. <coughs> now the exploration of the unknown causes has always been the subject of philosophy and of science and in general terms of all the human enterprises motivated by the innate curiosity that derives from the very nature of the universe. So um, I'm going to draw here a couple of little things. I mean I know that uh, that uh, Rick is here and he makes very good circles. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make circles as good as yours, but um, I'm going to draw an aerial view. Imagine that this is the base of a mountain. This is the top. And here around these mountains are little people all over the place and animals and so on. 
and they are dealing with causes and effects which they can understand. But this I will call the mountain of the unknown causes. Now I'm going to draw a side view of this. And this is the mountain. These are the little people. And this is the top of the mountain. And these are their causes and effects all over the place. And this is the mountain of the unknown causes. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that for the moment. So, throughout the centuries of exploration of the unknown realm, through thought and intuition, through revelation and experiment, humanity has gradually gnawed at the mystery and has achieved age after age the clarification of causes that had not been understood before. Now we know what gravity is, we know what electromagnetic is, we understand what electricity is, we understand the causes behind the internet somehow and behind uh, you know, television, we understand the causes behind many diseases that we didn't understand before. Uh, so this circle is getting smaller, okay, and smaller. Now, science, since its, since its emergence, science went on its way exploring the secrets of matter, living and non-living, and has explored the micro and the microcosms cosmos with spectacular revelations. Philosophy on its part has gone for the secrets of the mind, for elucidating the mind-body relationship, for the phenomena of perception and experience, the phenomenon of consciousness, for the imaginative adventure of explaining the nature of reality through metaphysics. So this, after, in, after I see this project as getting to this point, and I see that at this point it would be necessary to explain what are the roots of the concept of becoming. Where does this com concept come from, from all this uh, background? And so the, the thing that has to be, the little history that has to be done is to explain that the idea of becoming originated with a, within essential process themes that were the concern of a tradition and of a consensus that can be traced back to the mid 18th century. Now the preoccupation with process themes began as a protest uh, movement by the Romantic revolutionaries of the French and the German Enlightenment against materialistic mechanism. Now, this, the anti-mechanistic concerns, first expressions can be found in the, word, in the works <coughs> of the Enlightenment figures of Diderot and Maupertuis, whose ideas were the grounding and were later developed in several forms, in several approaches, uh, by the Romantic Natur philosophy, by the, the in, they were um, uh, expressed through the Natur philosophy that was developed by Lamarck, Goethe, and Schelling and Hegel in the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, contrary to the mechanistic paradigm, the Natur philosophy approach emphasized a dynamic and organic universe characterized by evolutionary transformation through novelty and creativity, where God and nature are one, where matter and spirit were regarded as two features of the same underlying force, where the cosmos was envisioned as a harmoniously unifying, unified network of integrally related parts. So this kind of thinking started coalescing 
you know, being expressed uh, uh, by these people during the 18th and 19th century, uh, but the beginning of the 20th century, in relationship to the concept of becoming, I want to mention three thinkers who imbued in this vision of, of unity and, on a, and, and of an organic universe, articulated philosophical the theories where becoming was, was, a concept, was a central concept. The first one that I'm going to mention is Henry Bergson, who lived between 1859 and 1941. And he postulated this extraordinary idea of duration which he defined, and I love this definition, and I quote, essentially a continuation of what no longer exists into what does exist. Now, duration, according to um, Bergson, is real time, as it flows, perceived, and lived. It's the time we feel, we experience. Duration, and I'm quoting here, therefore implies consciousness, as we place consciousness at the heart of things for the very reason that we credit them with a time that endures. Duration, as Bergson conceived it, conceived it, is that time between the before and the now, and the now and the after, and it is, it is the undivided flow of perceived and lived time, the continuous undivided time where the universe continuously decides what it will become and how it will evolve. <coughs> now, relatively contemporary to uh, Bergson, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was born in 1881 and 1955, he, uh, asked, he was a paleontologist, a philosopher, and a theologian. And he was one of the, the, the ones that played a very significant role, I would say one of the earliest roles, in waking up the Western mind to the account of an unfolding cosmos and of its spiritual meaning. Now, through his work as a paleontologist, Thierry de Chardin was able to observe the, the signs of, uh, of the flow of evolution. And as a philosopher and as a theologian, he combined this, he merged this with his Christian faith. Uh, Teilhard postulated that everything in the physical world has a within and a without, and that the whole world is involved in a process of cosmogenesis towards the omega point. He also proposed that the omega, the universe's telos, could make itself feel internally, and I quote, even in the fragmentary pre-living centers as psychic energy, and then physical energy could be interpreted as the statistical byproduct of a great number of elementary psychic energies, energies of atoms. I am not going to go further into this area of Teilhard's theory because I just want to point out the strong presence of the concept of becoming in his vision of reality and point out to the physical as well as the spiritual dimension of it. Now, while, while all, all this was going on, you know, <coughs> these philosophers were working here and coming up with these new ideas of transformation and cosmogenesis and becoming. The scientists, on the other hand, were busy. And in the beginning of the 20th century, Einstein published his theory of relativity, and Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Bohr published the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quantum theory. Now, according to physicist Nick Herbert, whom I'm going to quote here uh, several times because it's uh, a book that I read and I used for my dissertation, uh, the uh, quantum theory is the best clue we possess concerning the real nature of the, of the world we live in. Due to experimental evidence, and in spite of the many disagreements regarding the, the final nature of the physical world, um, there are several fundamental matters on which physicists now seem to agree. And the first point of consensus is that quantum facts have destroyed the distinction between matter and fields. Planck, Einstein, and Compton showed that waves are also particles 
and the Broglie demonstrated that particles are also waves. Now again, according to physicist Nick Herbert, quantum facts therefore have empirically established that the world is made of one substance, quantum stuff, or koons, which combine particles and waves at once in, and I quote, a peculiar quantum style of its own. What stands between the wave and the particle is the act of measurement, thus advancing the idea that mind or consciousness play a role in the definition of the degree of actuality, in, in quotes of the word. Now, while this guy, so this scientist were going up the unknown, trying to figure out the unknown causes on this side of the mountain. And uh, another guy showed up in uh, the philosophical area that has to do with the concept of becoming. And that was Alfred North Whitehead, who lived between 1861 and 1947. And now that we've uh, had a little idea of what the scientists with were doing at the time, I will explore, and this is something that I need to um, um, also make a part of, of this project, the ways in which Whitehead and his idea of becoming through the process of concrescence can be considered to be congruent with the basic, most fundamental tenets of quantum theory. In spite of the many different interpretations of quantum facts, physicists agree on the existence of a deep reality, a realm of waves of possibilities that only become actual through the process of observation or measurement, that is through the intervention of consciousness. Now in his book again, Physics and Philosophy, no, excuse me, this is another book. <laughs> in Physics and Philosophy, uh, uh, Werner Heisenberg, and this I uh, quoted, I quoted to you at the beginning of the talk, which was published in 1958, he wrote that the probability wave introduces something standing in the middle between the idea of an event and the actual event, a strange kind of physical reality just in the middle between possibility and reality. So it could be suggested that if we extrapolate between the realm specifically related to particles and waves, this idea is very similar to Whitehead's concept of an actual location's concrescence, which takes place at the boundary between the actual and the possible, between the quantum and the real worlds. Remember that uh, White has called uh, an actual location a quanta of experience, or a quantum of experience. In light of the problem posed by the existence of these two realities um, uh, that is postulated by quantum theory, and by Heisenberg's something which stands in the middle, uh, Herbert, physicist Herbert asks the following questions. Which of the world's myriad processes qualify as observations, he asks. Well, I will suggest that Whitehead's answer would be all of them. That Whitehead called these processes actual locations, which are in his words, the final real things of what the world is made of. Herbert's next question on the subject of the two realms of reality was, what special feature of an observation endows these processes with the power to create reality? I will here suggest that Whitehead's answer would be that all actual occasions or drops of, experiences, of experience can be considered as observations or measurements of deep reality, and that it is an actual occasions final decision or choice what collapses the probability wave into an actual fact. Could you say that last sentence? Okay. I will here suggest that Whitehead's answer would be that all actual occasions or drops of experience can be considered as observations or measurements of deep reality and that it is an actual occasion's final decision or choice what collapses the probability wave into an actual fact. 
I would propose that in general terms, Whitehead's metaphysical model coincides with quantum theory regarding the, existing, the existence of two realms of reality, the actual and the possible, and that it is also congruent with the premise that mind everywhere is involved in the creation of reality through a process of becoming. So this brings these guys to the top of the mountain. And of the unknown causes, not because we have discovered all of the unknown causes or because we have deciphered the mystery, but because this idea, the perspective that they have from there, uh, the concept of becoming, tells us that the mystery is to be th sought in the within of things, the yards within, in the flow of perceived and lived time, Bergson's duration, in the space between cause and effect, as in White's concrescence. In other words, in a dimension that is everywhere, but beyond our physical perception, it's all over the place. That's where this mystery is. So, <clears throat> in other words, in a dimension that is everywhere, beyond our physical perception, a dimension where God is constantly whispering to us, poking at our imagination to move into the next creative moment. And that's my conundrum. Where, how do I have come to the, to the, you know, to the um, understanding or the explanation in my mind of the idea of becoming, and from here on, or how do I get into this internal space in an accessible manner to be able to explain it beyond what I have reached here? And that's where I am now. And um, I would love to hear ideas, comments, suggestions, uh, because this is a proposal that needs to be finished. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes? Uh, a lot of this is new to me. So I'm just wrapping my brain around it as best I can. Can you restate what you mean by in this internal space? Okay. There is in every event that's happening in the world, you know, in any thought, any of your thoughts, in any cell in my body, there is a continuous moving into a, a different, something of a different kind, in a different state. Now, as, as uh, Bergson says, there is a before and a now, and there's a now and an after. So, what goes on within that entity that's becoming, that it's building itself, that's in, uh, in between, so what it was before changes into what it is now. There is a process there, that it's a, a, a process that it's outside of, of according to these philosophers, according outside of physical time. And uh, by, by saying before and after, or saying one minute and, and two minutes and three minutes, we're cutting time in slices. But time is really a continuous, and that we are not focusing in that piece, that, that that flow, we don't really understand it. And that is one of Whitehead's uh, big things, is he describes that process, the process of concrescence, in which he says, well, at every moment, uh, there is the influence of the past that comes from everywhere into that particular moment. There's the influence of the present that that entity is facing, 
And that has to be uh, put together in some kind of meaning, and then the entity flows into a new state that is, um, that is produced by this flow of the past into in, of what that doesn't exist into what exists now, and then it, it will flow into the future. It's that connection, that process that goes at every moment between past and, and future, and past and now and now and future, that is that space that I'm talking about. It's that space that uh, Bergson calls duration and, and White it calls con uh, actual, the, the concrescence of an actual location. So you're using the term space in kind of a metaphorical sense. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, because in, in fact, <clears throat> Henry Bergson, one of the things he, he uh, argues is that there really is time, but that, that there's no space. And that is another very difficult thing that I still don't understand very well. Um, so, I, I might be going back a little bit with this, but um, I was thinking about what, how you were, you wanted to differentiate being and becoming in this way, and then for the, the common person. Um, and I, I was thinking about, um, like when, in my, my experience in my permaculture class, and in looking onto a landscape, and so maybe before this permaculture class, I would look onto a landscape and see objects. I would see a tree, I would see grass, I would see clouds, I would see, um, you know, whatever was there as, it's, as um, objects that they were being, maybe, mm -hmm. in kind of this stationary way, almost like instead of flows of information between them, just deposits of information in each object. object. So then when you're talking about um, nothing is a stationary being, but that everything is in a process of coming through processes of information exchange and things like you're saying duration, where something lasts within a thing after maybe the cause of it passes, or mm -hmm. I can't repeat the words you were saying. It made me think of um, like the process of growing food and how there's soil and there's air and there's water and all of these things that go into the, the and if you watch, if you, if you buy a carrot at the store, you just get carrot. But if you grow the carrot, you watch it grow from seed to table. Um, so in that way, you're more connected with the becoming yeah. process. So when you were asking how do you explain it just in maybe in a simpler way, that's what I was thinking of was, was um, landscape as process yeah. rather than ent a collection of entities and that extends into us also. Now that doesn't go all the way down into Whitehead's spaces between co concrescence necessarily, but there's something about interdependence there and the flows of information in creating constantly moving selves that are always changing and exchanging information. I don't know. Yeah, I think I that's a very good uh, suggestion because, in fact, I think that's where the opportunity for creative writing in this project comes through. Just, you know, through these this, um, examples that can be examples as you as you are mentioning you know of somebody grow, growing a garden and and uh, suddenly having the feeling that that plant that was seen yesterday as a deposit of or or a bunch of leaves or whatever suddenly changed and transformed and and that brings to my mind the image I pr you probably have seen it of when they put a slow camera in the growth of a, of a root from, of, of a seed from the earth or, or the opening of a flower and you see the very slow opening of the flower that you don't see. You don't, as a human, you don't perceive it. You see the flower a little like this and the next morning it's a little like this. But that flow, 
you don't see it. And uh, I think that's, that's a very good suggestion. And I think that would make the project for me a lot more palatable because it allows for a little creative writing to yeah. be able to explain these things. Yeah, because I think it's difficult for us to acknowledge processes that we don't see. Yeah. And we live in a world where we don't see a lot of the processes and part of um, re embedding ourselves seems to be the ability to see process in the nature of everything. Yeah. And I really learned that in my permaculture class and in classes in PCC yeah. too. Well, good. Let's talk to you later. <laughs> you, I mean, you should see what happened to me when I tried to explain the idea of concrescence to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, was, uh, thank you for that. Um, I my background is in sort of in literature and um, just in terms of um, utopia as a as a helpful um, way of seeing the potentiality of creative writing, for instance. So I'm just kind of looking at this this mountain, and it sort of seems like, you know, the the goal of this mountain, the directive, is to climb it and climb it and climb it, so that when you're at the very top of the mountain, it's almost like that objective has been completed, and it's at this point that you're free to kind of choose um, what else to do. So you could choose to look out out onto the scenery. You could choose to sit down and have a drum circle at the top of the mountain or whatever you want to do. Um, and, um, you know, just in terms of utopia being a, a way to, you know, to kind of actualize or bring, bring to consciousness um, the sort of infinite possibilities of what could be um, you know, whether it's expressing an ideal society or, you know, mm -hmm. um, be um, integrally kind of help move, um, you know, a garden forward into its, into its own thing. So um, I, I think that's really helpful for me in terms of just kind of coming to terms with that um, point at which it's time to kind of figure out what you want to do. And so as the consciousness kind of is made manifest by what, how we choose to interact with the world, um, I think it's really helpful. Um, as, I mean, I, I, that's what I see, uh, that's what I see this being a kind of way to show just um, how you can kind of make the reality you want. Yeah, and I, um, you know, I, now that you use the word utopia, um, it would be a good idea. And in some ways I did that um, in my dissertation, where I, as part of my arguments um, about creative, the power of creative writing, I wrote stories that were based on the on, 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 on the understanding of a person that was already thinking in a postmodern, from a postmodern post of view. So uh, I, I was kind of lying, uh, um, putting out my utopian vision of how people would think at a certain point. And uh, so also, that's a good suggestion, thank you. And uh, one clarification though, when these guys get up here, I think the, the, the idea, the, the way I see it, is that they realize that the unknown causes are not here, inside. They are all over in every, in every uh, element of, of the universe. But it's, it's the dimension of that element where the unknown, in the within, where you have to look for the unknown causes. But thank you, that's a very good thing. Thing the idea of utopia is kind of interesting um, because it's sort of the U the U T O P I A um, sort of takes off the the initial E or O of the word, which kind of distinguishes whether it's a good place or no place. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
the kind of um, indeterminacy of that, I think, is interesting. It just talks about the potential. Okay, well, I have two great suggestions. Growing gardens and a utopian attitude. Utopian. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Hold on, can I read? Um, I, I want to kind of just probably simple fa factual thing and, and, and the other uh, something that you just brought up now that yeah. I could use a little help understanding. The simple question is, you know, uh, a lot what you were focused on, by the way, I really appreciate what you presented here and I kind of poetic uh, um, way you have of articulating pretty complex uh, ideas, as I guess you and your husband have discussed. Uh, <laughs> um, and I was, uh, in terms of Whitehead's connection to um, coherence with quantum physics, yeah. uh, of course Whitehead was, you know, lived during the period when quantum physics uh, emerged and yeah. came of age, uh, and he, you know, he's very attentive to, I mean, obviously, physics generally, relativity theory, he had his own theory, and by, by the, oh, am I supposed to hold that? Um, it doesn't matter, we're getting it with this other mic. Okay, um, and by the time of, um, that, so Plotz, 1900, uh, but it's particularly what uh, I guess Schrodinger's in 1925, then Bohr and Heisenberg really have their breakthroughs, I think, in, in terms of complementarity and uncertainty principles in 1927. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty. Yeah, it's all pretty. And that's right when, of course, uh, Whitehead is doing yeah. uh, his, his great works. I'm just wondering how much was he uh, attending to and incorporating quantum physics into the particulars of his philosophical position around, you know, concrescence, for example, and uh, I mean, process and reality would have come out just right, almost the moment that the Solvay Congress 19, is happening. 1929. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, you yeah, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I mean this this the fact that he called uh, an actual location a. a, a quantum of experience, it's, it's not a coincidence. I mean, this idea of the quantum or the, 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 the physical world uh, existing in, in, in quanta, um, I think that, that, it, that he used that word. Uh, so I think that he very much kind of, uh, the, 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 the vision of quantum physics very much influenced his his, I would say, atomism in the sense of of, of seeing the world in in little, you know, um, emanations of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean it's fantastic. I was when I was preparing this and I was looking at the dates, and I saw, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Bergson, Teilhard, and Whitehead, and all, and Einstein, and and all these people, all coming. Oh, the, the 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 beginning of the the first half of the 20th century was unbelievable with all these new things that came up. So, the question I suppose is how to s how to separate the fil how to separate what is the philosophical vision and what is the influence of, of physics in Whitehead. But the question at the same time is why do we need to separate? Anna? I wasn't so much interested in you know, the separation, but I guess I'm, I'm so interested in uh, kind of like intellectual biography yeah. and um, how, how ideas um, gestate and are shaped by meetings and influences, et cetera. Yeah. I, I was just curious. My, uh, my question uh, that's more kind of, you could just help me understand, like when you first put the people at the top of the mountain of unknown mm -hmm. causes, I was a little alarmed because, I mean, that's, 
that's a, implicitly a God's eye view. You know, yeah. uh, who, who's who's at the top of the mountain? We're all we're all still climbing, and we don't even know how high that mountain the is. The mountain flattens. Okay, and <laughs> and then what I'm then suddenly just now, in answer to your last question, you you redefined. It sounds like the mountain yeah. of unknown causes yeah. to be all around instead of that pyramid. Yeah. What was the definition of the pyramid if it wasn't unknown causes? Uh, because really, it's still... Well, the unknown causes, I, I would say that um, is still, we're talking of the physical realm here, the, 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 the actual world, okay? And so re reality, what progress in science and in the other uh, disciplines are doing is they, they have been narrowing these unknown causes that are accessible, that have been accessible through science and so on. But the, there is that what, what, what this, what I understand these people are saying, Bergson and, and Whitehead and so on, is that there is a realm of reality that we haven't we haven't, we didn't even imagine before. And that is that, that what Baum called the implicate order, or, uh, or this, this, the difference between the possible and the actual, or that space that, that uh, Heisenberg talks that it's in between. So the, the, this, this unknown causes that we have been knowing at, they're still in a dimension that we can understand. But once these guys got here, you know, they realized that there's still an enormous field of unknown causes that are not in here, in, they're not in the physical realm, but they are, they are all over the place in this dimension that we still haven't really okay, so, grasped. So that mountain of unknown causes was really just a mountain for the materialistic um, exactly. quest, but it doesn't include religious yeah. or metaphysical yeah. views that are did. Okay, that, yeah. that's helpful. Thanks. Can I jump in on this exactly? Yeah. Um, what before you had the unknown causes continue out? I thought you were going to say that they get to the top of the mountain, they realize <laughs> that they don't know anything about the interior of the mountain. Mm -hmm. They've only climbed the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm and then you have to go Well, that's go another interpretation. That's another metaphor. I mean, I, I was just uh, thinking in that that could be a perfect metaphor that that's, but the, the thing that goes against that metaphor is that, you know, with the advances of science and the advances in social sciences and in, in uh, uh, humanities, whatever, we have been, we have been, we have been narrowing the things we don't know, and that's what you know, what we call materialistic progress. But uh, it's we have not, and and this those those things were accessible when we were start making little you know nicks and knacks on this. But there was one element, one point in this that is not, it's not in here. It's that. This, there is a dimension where the mystery is spread all over because it, it's, it's, it is in every entity in what Teilhard would have said, the within, the within of things, which is not a dimension that, that we have been looking at. Can I throw in a, just a little idea yeah. too? You also said it collapsed. Yes. Yeah, that, that, I like that a lot. Yeah. So the mountain to me would be the... Um, it would be the uh, so the mechanistic paradigm yeah. that thinks it's going to solve everything. Yeah. And then when they got to the top, the whole thing collapsed. Yeah. And there's still knowledge, yeah. but compared to what's unknown, it's that's, doesn't matter. That's much. a good thing. Matt, you had a question. Yeah. I'm channeling Albert Einstein, and so <laughs> that was just what I was wondering. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, th your your whole. Um, the track that you're following is really exciting to me. I think we're, you and I are kind of um, surfing the same probability wave or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been thinking about, you know, that I'm, you know, you were in Jake's process class yeah. the first part of the semester. And, um, 
you know, doing dissertation uh, research for my own dissertation, incorporating Whitehead into contemporary cosmology, uh, relativity, and quantum theories mm -hmm. in particular. And um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering how much you've gotten into. I mean, there's a profound congruence, and um, these thinkers complement one another, but there are also these subtle differences between yeah. Bergson and Whitehead on yeah. the one hand, but also. Whitehead and Einstein, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if, if you've been able to start to yeah. tease those out a little bit. Okay, well, uh, you know, I call this kind of a forest project. I, I, <laughs> I always, you know, we always talk about the forest and the tree, mm -hmm. and um, when we know, we get to know several trees, we kind of get an idea of what the forest might look like. And then from there, we kind of extrapolate and we, we create a, uh, you know, if, if, if all these trees, these five or six or seven trees have this particular characteristic, then the forest might look probably this way. But uh, it's, it's very possible that, or it's very certain, that many of the trees in the forest are going to be different. Right. So that's, the, I, I'm, I call this kind of a forest view because I'm kind of putting an umbrella on a lot of ideas. That's why I, I concentrate on one particular concept because I know that, you know, um, Whiteheadians would argue to death with Bergsonians about the difference between their Bergson's ideas and, and, and Whitehead's ideas. And That's called the narcissism of minor differences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and how many how many angels fit on a on the you know on the, the the top of a pin or something? But for me, my 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 um, my joy is when I can see something here that that really the, the thought of this person really coincides with the thought of this other person. Sometimes they haven't even met. And in fact, I would be very curious to know how Bergson and Teilhard and, and White, had, if they ever met or interacted or influenced each other, because they were living at practically at the same time. I don't know if you can add something to that, but... Uh, I can't. Yeah. Uh, okay. But usually nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. I mean, the, the great story is when um, uh, Marcel Proust uh, met James Joyce. Mm -hmm. They both, everyone knew these were like unbelievable geniuses giving birth to something new. And they were at a party and they got together and so forth. And um, uh, it's, I forget which said which, but uh, Proust the same, yeah. was talking about chambermaids. <laughs> and, um, and Joyce talked about um, um, the chambermaids of royalty. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, they just couldn't. They couldn't connect. Yeah. I mean, in other words, to connect is is. Uh, and I think and it's. Think it's I think it's time. I think it's time that you know, with that, with with the perspective of time, is when you can see the the similarities between the thought of, the, of, of, of these people. And the, you, you also can see the differences, but sometimes the similarities are so important mm -hmm. because they are the, cre they are the grounding for, for these new ideas that come up later. Um, Bergson and Whitehead have a lot more in common. Yeah. I think um, another story about in terms of them meeting, Whitehead and Einstein did meet. Mm -hmm. Fought, I think. What's that? They fought, I think. Well, I don't know if they fought. They oh. had, they had, they, they met uh, over the course of a few days. But the first occasion of their meeting, um, the the guest uh, who invited both of them to his house took them aside after dinner and pushed them into his study alone and said, "You guys probably have so much to talk about." <laughs> and they're both shy. Einstein's English wasn't that great either. Um, but they, they kind of just stood there, um, digging their feet into the carpet, kind of not sure what to say to one another. And then it, it took a few drinks and <laughs> other people in the conversation the next day to get them to, to start uh -huh. arguing a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, but in regards to this, this core concept of becoming mm -hmm. that you're talking about, Einstein didn't seem to be, although his, you know, his discovery was profound mm -hmm. in the literal sense of it, it sort of opened up this uh, groundlessness 
in, yeah. in our understanding of, of space and time where they're completely relative. Motion is completely relative, so mm -hmm. there's no absolutes anymore. Yeah. Um, but what Whitehead wanted to do was push, was push Einstein a little bit further than he was willing to go in, in, in interpreting his own discovery. Yeah. Um, Whitehead, or Einstein, you know, you probably know about how he he admitted to the biggest mistake of his career is when he fudged his equation and added this cosmological constant yeah. so that the universe wouldn't expand. That's right. Yeah. It turns out they discovered later it was expanding. Yeah. Um, Einstein wanted a static universe with eternal laws that wasn't changing. That's right. um, and he also wanted a universe where the future in some sense already existed. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't potential or the, the way that Heisenberg was talking about the ideal and the real sort of yeah. coexisting. The possible and the actual, yeah. The possible and the actual. Um, Einstein's vision seemed to be more like, you know, there's this four-dimensional loaf of space-time yeah. where the future is, is just out there somewhere waiting for us to catch up with it or something. Whereas Whitehead and Bergson both thought that time was inherently creative mm -hmm. and that the future didn't exist yet and it was wildly open. Yeah. They didn't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a big difference. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's that's what you know, that's the the, the 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 danger of this kind of generalization is to uh, to kind of fall into a flaw in that sense in 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 um, um, not being uh, accurate in the interpretation of some scientific facts or, or something like that. So that, that's where uh, the, the, the generalization has to be very, very careful. Yeah. And that's why when, you, when somebody's writing this kind of thing and, uh, you know, one jumps into some conclusion, it's very good to have some scientist around or physicist to put the to the foot on your yeah. and say hey well, it's hard to, <laughs> to do philosophy in the context yeah. of you know physics and science is really hard yeah yeah I we have a friend that is a biologist or I don't know what Wojciech is his background but he just absolutely um, gets absolutely out of he gets absolutely enraged at the idea of the popularization of science because he says the moment you popularize science, you uh, are falsifying the data. So, you know. What's the data for? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. Um, I've been thinking about, um, in terms of, of the process of becoming and having experience that we were talking about, but, you know, what what happens between what has been between you know then and now yeah. and then what happens between now and where we're moving mm -hmm. um, and you know it seems like what like starting now into where we're moving seems infinitely open a million things can happen I could choose to raise my left arm than my right or my right than my left now that's still true but if we look back it seems to be reduced you know it seems to be fixed in a singular possibility yeah. that's what I did that's what I will always have done um, but I know that, I mean, I, my understanding of quantum physics is really elementary, I guess, but I know I've, I've you know, um, I've heard people explaining that time kind of takes on a much different quality um, in the quantum sense of things. And it's just this whole process, it's, it's got me thinking about how we, that there still seems to be a, a sense in which what has already happened does seem radically open in a certain sense. Like uh, Rick brought up today um, in class about you know the, these two different myths that we can interpret um, the modern ascent or descent mm -hmm. um, through you know the myth of progress and the myth of the fall. Um, you know, and depending on which interpretation we hold, or if we try to hold both simultaneously, it will, you know, it, we can see it as kind of having an effect then on how we're going to become based on how we treat what has been. Um, so in, in that way, how that affects where we're going, um, does that, you know, what it's kind of thing is, does that still start now and move in to the future and that, that, that difference will only occur between now and what will become, or is there a sense in which it is somewhat maybe changing the nature or altering what has been into the now and well as well in some way? Okay, let me see if I understand. What you're saying, you're saying that something that has been uh, can alter the nature 
of what is coming. I mean, you look at the past and the nature of today can be altered by what has been, or are you thinking that we can alter the nature of what has been from now? In the sense of how we choose to interpret it, I guess, or choose to understand it. Okay. Um, there, you know, I, I'm going to go to a, t a term that is very Whiteheadian. It's called the superject. Is that everything that that it has been uh, is, and then becomes an, a cause, an influence for the for the rest of the, you know, it's called. Uh, um, it, and and so he he says that the 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 universe, the world, is made by this uh, subject superject. You are a subject when you're becoming, and you are a superject in the influence that you're going to have in, the, in what's becoming. But that, 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 what, that, what you were, what you did, or what happened in the past is going to be incorporated into every new event in an objective way. That means you are going to interpret it one way, and you are going to grab that superject in one particular uh, dimension, and Matt is going to grab it from another dimension. So um, the, 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 that, that event that is in superject, that is not a becoming, it's a being now, it's going to influence you two in a different way because you are both objectively, from your subjectivity, you're going to interpret it differently. Okay? But, but the, what happened in the past, if you eliminate all the subjectivities, it's, it's only one thing. Right. I don't know if yeah, I could get to that. Speak on that because um, that Vogelin presentation, they talk about remembering the future. And um, I know Hillman also talks about patients who they have a traumatic experience, and then obviously that is a cause. But then moving forward, uh, the way they interpret that past experience um, can shape their future. So if they choose to continue to see it as a traumatic event, then they're the ones causing the trauma in that moment moving forward. Yeah. So, um, okay. yeah. yeah. So the objectivization of what of what happened before changes, and so you 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 uh, you interpret you receive the event from the past in a different way. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a a question that I think relates to what you're bringing up, and it has to do with. Um, so I'm thinking of these moments in between, in the process of becoming the space in between that you're talking about, in between concrescence as moments where possibilities are renegotiated. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so you have um, maybe a moment that comes into being and then in between that moment and the next moment, there's something that happens where in order for a new spectrum of possibility to appear, possibilities need to be renegotiated, and there are different loci from which those possibilities can be renegotiated. One of them is the laws of math and science. One of them is subjective experience. One of them is, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking about it in that way mm -hmm. and wondering if that well, seems like anything, like that there's this renegotiation that's constantly happening in every moment in the process of becoming of what, what even the possibilities of, the field of possibility that what is becoming can come out of is always changing. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it's like whiteheads. Yeah, yeah, the field of possibilities is always changing. Uh, if, if, uh, if you follow whitehead, uh, what is coming, what is becoming actual uh, is, is returned to the to the area to the world of possibilities um, 
he talks, I don't know if you're very aware of White or not, but it's kind of an organic flow between the possibilities, what possibilities are realized in the actual, and then that changes again the possibilities that are available for each actual occasion. So there's, a, there's an interaction there. But um, I, if, if I understand your question correctly, you say where well, is that what's in between? Well, well, there's, there's, there's. That's what. That's exactly what you're talking about. Is what happens within the the duration, of Bergson duration, or the concrescence is where there there's a stimulus. There's a you know the stimulus of the past coming in, and there's the stim. There's, the, 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 I mean, the the cost the cost of the past and the stimulus from the present. And the, there's something there that, depending on the degree of complexity, if you're a stone, you have very little possibilities. You know that the temperature is changed. Uh, my molecules are, you know, this molecule decides that it's going to expand, and it doesn't have much possibilities. But you are, but if you're a complex human being, and you have uh, a stimulus from the world and from your past, and, and you have causes from your past, then you have many possibilities from which to select. Uh, but that is a continuous, it's, it's something that it, it all comes together in, in a flow. I don't know if I've answered your question a little bit there. I'm wondering what my question has to do with your question. <laughs> Okay, like my, my question. Your question about the space in between or about the, 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 comp, the relationship between the past and the now and the now. And, and how to explain it, yeah. Because I'm thinking of potential and possibility in between, so. Yeah. But, it, but it's always changing. It's the, 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 the possibilities? The, the spectrum of possibility in any moment. It's always changing. It's always changing. Time keeps changing. I mean, time is almost like the landscape upon which possibilities change from moment to moment, depending on yeah, but what the already happened. The possibilities change according to what that particular becoming does. Right. Okay, or decides, or right. becomes. The then, yeah, then the possibilities that were there for that particular becoming change for the next one mm -hmm. because of the influence of you know we are all everything is interconnected so whatever is happening is is, is um, um, according to white it is is um, influencing everything else so the Sorry, but can I go, is, are you Lydia? Yes. Okay, Lydia. When Lydia was talking about the carrot, um, I, I was really helped. I'm very visual. Yeah. Okay, so now that you're talking about the negotiation, you, you also said something about flow of information, and I translated it immediately into flow of energy. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about energy as we've been going on up here, and I'm wondering, so, so your negotiation uh, brought to mind the carrot growing that runs into a rock. And you know how they then, mm -hmm. you know, but they keep growing. So there's been a negotiation between the energy inside and the reality it bumped up against. Mm -hmm. And so then I started thinking, well, um, what's happening in the energy? Is it, is it like the chrysalis with the butterfly where there's, the energy is totally changing the matter inside? Or, or is it that when you, when you started talking now about this mystery is all around, um, you're, you're altering the playing field. You're, we're not going to be able to discuss this with regard to carrots because we're now talking about the invisible flow of energy, not the flow of energy that we can track with, our, with all the skills that we've developed, but the flow of energy 
that um, is most the field of the um, mystics and mm. the, you know. Yeah, but I, I see that that whatever that flow of energy or, the, or what the mystics talk about is precisely what is in this in this in this dimension and when you talk about the carrot and the rock here's the rock and here's the plant of the carrot okay oh no the plant is up here the carrot is here and the root su suddenly hits the rock the rock and so there is as you said here is the possibilities for that little entity that's there, the last cell that's growing, change because it cannot keep on growing in the direction it was going. So the possibilities for that little guy have changed so it has to sell, decide where to die or to start growing this way. So there's in that space where that moment comes in in which the, the root hits the rock, there's a change of possibilities for that cell that it's at the tip and there is a decision or a choice from the possibilities that are open to it that do not include now growing into the rock. I don't know if that... Right, okay. But and in that... What I did then was I switched and said but are we talking about something that I can measure, which is the flow of energy that is going on in the carrot, or something for which I no longer have words? Huh. And in, in talking about that moment, am I, um, have, I, have I run out of the tools that I need to discuss what's happening there or what's happening in all of the mysteries we yeah. have. Yeah, and there. that is, I think you have, you know, you have passed from the, from the, the, the realm of science to the realm of metaphysics there. I, and and I, that's my question to you. Yeah. But can the, uh, that transfer, uh, transfer or, or shift be made? Can I add something to the carrot and the rock that maybe yeah. my, my, is that um, there's multiple, this is what I was trying to see if I could put words to, is that there's multiple influences into that moment of the possibilities for the carrot and when you're pointing to the surface of the cell on the rock, that is um, possibilities that are defined by physical space, um, s space and time Limitation. limitations, yeah. but that there might also be other um, sources of that help create creative Yeah, that help create fields of possibility in that moment that aren't just physical. Yeah. And that are also, I don't know, I don't, I can't think of examples, but, um, but we tend to see it only, that there's only one source for events and that it's the physical world and that, yeah. but there might be a combination of other things like realms of potentiality or I don't know that. That's also, it's, so I don't know if that goes into that's, a little yeah. bit. That's, that's, that's it, that there's. The the the, the 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 physical comes forth from the realm of potentiality. It, the decision that that an event makes for the next moment comes not from a physical uh, dimension, but from the pot the potentialities that where are they? I mean, we don't know. It's the wrong question. Oh, is it the wrong question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about, how about like you know? Let's just go to the mind body example. Like you know, I just I just got over a bug, and so you know that when you get sick, you never you always wonder when was that moment you became sick, right? Because your body is you just you're just there in your body and being yourself, and at some point you go, hey, I got sick, right? And you you feel that sickness within you, 
And we can all say there's a physical realm. If you're, you're staying with a typical allopathic model, you, you know, some little buggy jumped in you and ooh, you're sick. Okay. But we all know, too, that we, the mind-body thing, that sometimes things happen, even diseases that people could get, whatever, bad diseases, they could be terminal, et cetera, et cetera, and something happens in perhaps this realm on the top of the mountain with all the good stuff happening, and, you know, and something shifts, and, the, and, the, and, 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 it, and something choice is made, we don't know how, and, the, and it's gone, right? The disease just goes away. People go, oh, it's a miracle. You know, we all know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. There's that moment, where, and, it, and it sometimes it just happens, sometimes it happens through, you know, people think it's you know, prayer, whatever, you, can, you know, all kinds of possibilities. But in that physical, psycho-spiritual realm, something may shift in a physical disease and a physical process, but we don't know exactly what's happening. Is that something kind of what you're talking about, too? Yeah. I mean, we, in the, un, on the unex, which is called all kinds of things, but we know in this process, it's we don't exactly know what happened. Yeah. Some but, things happen, but we don't know. We and we can't. Sometimes people think they know because I. One of the things I was thinking about too. It's funny when you're drawing all the little men up there or women or whatever they are. <laughs> that I have, whatever they are. When I was thinking of when I was learning calculus, we were doing the same thing. I remember my calculus professor, you know, putting all these little people because we have a tendency. It's, it's, it's almost impossible not to use discrete examples of talking about continuous processes. And you know, language is a discrete phenomenon. And so we're, we're just caught in this reality where we're using discrete words, which just come out as words, to describe this organic, continuous process with all this duration and concrete, all these things that are happening in between. And so we're, we're limiting ourselves through the language. I was thinking of poetry, too, because sometimes I think poetry is a way to describe some of these things in a ways that we can't do it through our yeah. you know, discourse this way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt had an observation here that is interesting. And uh, I would like to add that that's when, when uh, you know, when, when we're talking of the, the actual and the possible uh, and the, poten the, the potentiality and the real, what the, 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 there's this dimension of the, act of the possible is not a physical dimension. At, at least we don't know. We don't, for the moment we don't know. And this is, uh, you know, what the, the David Baum, the physicist, called the, uh, the um, implicit order, that which is under reality. Okay, one last thing. Yeah, you are done. Oh, sorry. Can I? Yeah. Okay, so, we don't know what, what happened to uh, the future, but uh, as I understand, the, the Einstein, the quantum theory is a, is a cosmic curve time and space can appear in the cosmic space. So in Sanskrit, the space means it's a, the Akashic. Mm -hmm. Akashic record is an uh, uh, anthroposophy or the Rudolf Steiner's uh, as a concept mm -hmm. in recent times. So we don't know what happened to us, but our all things is recorded in the in the cosmic space mm -hmm. because our whole the material uh, uh, matter is connected because uh, we can have some sense to connect with others and this is more as a larger and larger and then uh, this is a uh, uh, you said uh, everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. So, as I understand, uh, the Rudolf Steiner's this, the Akash record, we are all connected and also our all uh, things is recorded in cosmic, some record. So, as a cosmic, the universe is uh, still forging, making a story, and also we have an uh, archetype of uh, the earth and archetype of uh, the culture, archetype of uh, collective consciousness. So recently, the Dr. John C. Real is uh, everything is in 
found it, can find in our inside, and also the cardio. So we don't know what happened to the future, but that will be that will have the meaning of uh, the concept of Akashic record. So I want to suggest this uh, space and becoming some meaning is uh, related. If you find some mm -hmm. uh, idea in the China's the archive record, yes. it will be very helpful. I have to say thank you for the suggestion that I haven't connected Steiner uh, and I'm not very knowledgeable on Steiner, so I will have to kind of look around and see if I can find something. I, I have no courage, but Rick mentioned that in 1925, so 1925 is uh, the Steiner died here. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, I have courage. You know, there's actually a, a book that you were kind of writing as a two by, you, you may know it, called the, I think it's called the A Field or the Akashic. Uh, it's basically um, Urban Lasso does a kind of, he uses that whole idea of like an Akashic record, as it were, that is embedded in the sort of field of the universe as, mm -hmm. a, as a in which all events leave their information traces, as it were. Mm -hmm. So it, it serves as a kind of bridge between a Steinerian mm -hmm. uh, anthroposophical uh, esoteric vision and contemporary on physics and systems theory yeah. and so forth, which which uh, Laszlo is very. Akashi counter how to spell that? A K A. Science, yes, science, science in the Akashic field. Okay. Science in the Akashic field. Yes. Yeah. So, and how do you? L A S Z L O. A L S Z L O. L O. That's his name. That's how she lays it. Akashic is A K. Oh, Laszlo, I know. A K. A-H-I-C, Akashic. He writes a book every month, so yeah. don't give him a comic I think it's sort of like, the last count, uh, 85 books. Oh, it's wow. Wow. Who wrote this thing? Last? Uh, uh, Irvin Laszlo. Irvin Laszlo, yeah. Yeah, he's a and, uh, yeah. 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 And yeah. what's the name of the book? Uh, Science, Science in the Akashic Field. Oh, is that, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. This is so yeah. This point about the Akashic, mm -hmm. the Akashic record, it just, it, you know, we were asking before, where are the potentials? Where are the eternal mm -hmm. objects? Is yeah. Whitehead's word. Um, and I said it's, that might be the wrong question to ask. Yeah. But a good way of, you know, some people might say, because we can't really get our heads around where the potentials might be yeah. hiding and waiting. <laughs> To be actualized. Well, we could say the same thing about the past. Where is the past? No one denies that the past happened. Yeah. But where is it now? Yeah. Yeah. It's in the present. It's in the present. It's in the present. It's in the present. It's the eternal present. Well, but this has been a lot of fun, and I think it's time to. I've been getting some signals there. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your suggestions. Again, I'll come ask more. <laughs>